this annual meeting where they talk about using this light detection and ranging uh, laser um, range detection systems called LIDAR for, for forestry inventory. And it's, it's probably on its 20th year. Um, so they're at a point where this technology has come out of like concept phase and research phase and it's in the operational phase. So it's been tried and tested and people do it on a day-to-day -day basis, they use this inventory information from laser scanning from the airplanes. And so my talk is about how to better communicate where you can trust the information and where it's a little bit more, um, you know, low confidence information on the map. When you look at a map, you can say, here's my estimate of what trees are here. And I also have a number that tells me, you know, on a, on a scale of one to 10, how good is that information? so that I know if it's an area that has low confidence information, I then maybe have to send guys on the ground to go verify and measure stuff and, and get more information before I make decision management decisions on it. Mm -hmm. cool. So math stuff. Yeah, <laughs> any, any idea how big the panel is? So you're gonna be meeting with them on Zoom or some other online, other online kind of platform? Any idea yeah. how, how many people are? So there's 250 attendees that are statisticians and forest. Um, they're kind of the, the top dogs in the US Forest Service on uh, bringing new technology and, and forestry management in. Mm, cool, cool. cool. Yeah. Well, good, good luck with that. <laughs> Thanks, I just started preparing today. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I, I just learned I was doing it two days ago. Well, and I guess the, the hope is, I mean, you're, you're putting together a pitch, right? For for your for your company that you work for is that right kind of a or no you, the or just kind of explaining it or, or are you trying to sell them something it's a kind of a mixed bag so you're not supposed to go to these academic meetings and say here's our here's our company's solution and product buy it it's not a sales thing um, you go and you try to give information that's a little bit top secret so you try to take a little bit of your like intellectual property that makes your product really valuable and explain some components of it in a, in a more open source way. So more people can understand the benefits and why you would do that. And you focus more on the technical concepts. Meanwhile, the secret agenda is to just establish your, your company and product as a leader in that uh, development space. So you're not supposed to promote your business, but it's, it comes with the uh, territory. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Yeah. So you guys had a good spring break. Yeah. 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 I, awesome. you know, I think that the, it takes a week to unwind, you know, and, you, and then mm -hmm. after that, you have that one week that you kind of really relaxed. And, you know, I'm not going to lie, I could have used one more week, you know, I was happy to come here and see everybody, but uh, one more week would have been pretty sweet. But I guess <laughs> I had a long weekend this weekend, so, you know, I don't want to be a big complainer. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Well, today I was hoping to kind of, at, you know, bring together some of the stuff we've already talked about and just show some examples of maps that are online that use some of the concepts we've talked about. Um, with a focus entirely on forest mapping and forest changes over time. And um, yeah, we could talk a little bit about, you know, how the data is created, um, you know, some other use cases and some other kind of example maps of different information layers that are used for management and conservation and different uh, landscape projects. Cool, cool. I, quick question for you. Uh, we had a... We, we watched a little uh, video clip um, last week uh, about uh, the British Columbia. They're, they're, they're looking at uh, trying to find out why moose have been on the decline um, for, for so long. So they've, they've actually tracked or collared a whole bunch of uh, moose. And when, whenever, they, uh, whenever they, they die, they, uh, they send out helicopters and they go find out, they do like an investigation and find out why, and even go as far as doing autopsies. Um, oh yeah. Some of the, uh, it seems like a lot of the wildlife stuff, we haven't seen any kind of remote sensing beyond GPS tracking. Um, and I'm just wondering how else uh, it, it could be, how else it could be used. I guess, 
I guess maybe satellites, uh, we did talk a little bit about satellites being used to find um, penguins in Antarctica and they can look for, yeah. uh, because of the, the, the feces, uh, yeah. they're able to, to, to spot it. But can you think of any other ways that they, we use remote sensing in, in collecting information with wildlife? Yeah, for sure. So yeah, what you're talking about is, is detecting the presence and abundance of certain animals based on the kind of the information trails they leave behind based on their behavior. So that's called proxy data. It's a, it's a, not a direct measurement of the animals or the wildlife presence. It's an indirect measurement. So it's a, it's a proxy measurement. So we know that penguins create, you know, um, what's the proper ner a term for the scat? It's uh, guano. We know that they create guano when they're huddled together and they spend a lot of time in one area. And if we can measure the signature from space of that guano, then we have a pretty good relationship with how many penguins are there, how much time they spend there, you know, whether they're moving around, you know, based on that, that signal. So that proxy data is probably the most common way that we're measuring the presence of animals. Um, let's think of an example here. If you wanted to measure, um, you know, the, the location of where beavers are living on the landscape and you had some imagery uh, that came from an airplane and it was it was too coarse of resolution the pixels are too big that you couldn't actually see an individual beaver plus the fact that beavers are in the water most of the time you're not going to see them in the imagery anyway what could you look for that might indicate the presence of a beaver Yeah, the, the wood that they chew, dams. Yeah, yeah, they make big, big piles of wood on and on the landscape, and that causes water to back up. And and where there would otherwise be a stream of water, you would have kind of a reservoir caused. So the dams themselves are big enough to see in lower resolution imagery, and the and the presence of water bodies maybe in an area that would normally just have a stream instead of a a mini pond. Those are two excellent ways to, to indicate the presence of beavers. Um, so that's kind of the general idea we do, we, we apply when we're looking to measure something that's too small to see with the data that we have. And then, and that's called the, that's the, and, and looking for signs of it, that's the, the proxy data. We haven't heard that term, yeah. but we've looked at like uh, thinking about like um, trace fossils, right? Would be like, you know, a worm going through and you can tell that they were there you don't actually have the, the actual, you know, the actual, uh, the actual creature, right? Yeah, those are called proxy variables or proxy indicators, trying to measure something by the presence of something else that's related to them. Cool. And that's essentially what we do. And when I told you guys about the forest inventory work, we're, we're not able to see individual stems on the trees, but we can predict the branching structure of a tree based on the number of 3D points that get returned from a laser. Um, so we're, we're, we're indirectly able to predict the presence of something that we're interested in measuring through related variables. Right. Yeah, yeah that's kind of the name of the game when it comes to remote sensing. Um, now, on the flip side, if you wanted to get a direct measurement of something, um, there is now some examples of people using drones to do that because you can fly a drone much lower to the ground and you're going to get really high resolution photos and you're going to get the ability to see things like individual bird nests. So I have a friend who studies seabirds um, up in the Yukon. So along the coast of the Yukon territory, he goes and he measures the nesting behaviors and the population dynamics of seabirds because seabirds are really um, strong indicators of ocean health, right? The, 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 the ocean habitat that they rely on for food, if that is, is suffering or productivity decreases, the seabird populations are directly related. And so they do these population monitoring studies. And he wanted to know, can I measure all the nests without having to, he's a cliff climber. He goes and he actually climbs the cliffs that the seabirds nest on. And you can imagine he can't climb to every single nest when there's millions of nests. So he wants to measure the egg presence and he wants to understand how many eggs are they laying? Are the chicks surviving? 
um, is there maybe some cause if those patterns change? And uh, I trained them on how to use a drone to make a map of a cliffside in three dimension, like a 3D model. And then in, he has two options to actually go and count all those nests while he's sitting in the office on his computer looking through the imagery. He can go and he can do it manually and he can go and pick every single nest that he can see, um, which again, takes a lot of time and is, um, it's a boring task. <laughs> it's, it's a tedious, boring task that not really anybody wants to spend hours and hours and hours doing. So what you can do now with machine learning with a special type of um, algorithm called computer vision is you can, uh, and this is the same principles that a lot of the apps on your phone use to learn your behavior and how you use different apps on your phone is they're, they're tracking the patterns of what you're doing and then predicting what you're going to do next. And the same idea applies to finding things in an image, in a photo. If you can tell a computer, okay, this is a nest and this is a nest and this is a nest and this is one egg and this is two eggs and there's five eggs. If you do that enough times, you can then train the computer to do that for you with the rest of your data. Mm. And so remote sensing with the use of drones is now starting to use more direct measurements instead of these indirect measurements. But we can only do it on small scales right now because the amount of data to, to, to <clears throat> use a drone to map a huge area is just not, not possible. So you get the data and then you can, then you can the direct measurements and then you can extrapolate it over the, the landscape or the cliff in this case. And, and yeah. Cool. Yeah. And that's a way safer way to do it, right? You don't have to worry about falling off a cliff or getting attacked by a bald eagle while you're hanging off the edge of a, of a cliff. So there's lots of good reasons to, to try to use tools that are uh, unmanned for safety and liability. And right. Yeah. There's the three D's of using robots for, for science or for any kind of job you're doing. Do you guys, have you guys heard those before? There's the three D's. Three D's. No, we got a lot of head shakes. The three D's, what are the so, three D's, man? So Eight. dirty. Dirty? Dirty jobs, jobs that are just not safe for humans to do because they're so unsanitary, like going into a sewer. Right, right. Right, you, if you can get a robot in there, into a into a poop tube yeah <laughs> that's a good idea uh dull so we talked about you know really boring tasks that are like you know i'm picking out one thing in an image and i'm just doing it thousands of times you can train a computer to do that you win and <laughs> and dangerous so that third one you know climbing cliffs right. so dull dirty dangerous those are perfect applications for robots and computers. Right, right. Nice. Yeah, I guess they use them for like, uh, like bomb squad, that type of thing, right? Go in and mm -hmm. have a look at it with the camera and try to, yeah. Yeah. That's the name of the game in automation is make things safer, make them more efficient and make them uh, less expensive. Yeah. Um, Cool. Well, I've got some stuff to show you and, and a couple of questions for you guys. All right. So if this is going to be all about forests. You know, if it's too repetitive, just we could talk about something else. But these are some pretty cool maps that um, that are updated on a regular basis. And um, they're a good example of some of the things we've talked about and how we can use satellites and aer aerial mapping data to to help us understand how the world is changing around us as the number of people is growing and we use more of our natural resources. You know, you guys in your life are going to hear all this talk about sustainable development. And it's hard to picture, you know, why that's so important until you actually look at a map and see how much the landscape has changed um, in a very short amount of time, you know, in two or three lifetimes. Um, so we're just, we're, all of us right now are just living right on the edge of this really quickly growing trend of the whole surface of the planet changing very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. And it's called, uh, it, you know, it's changing so quickly that scientists have given us a new name for the geological period that we're living in. You know, it's called the Anthropocene. It's called the, Anthro is human, it's Latin for human, right? So we're living in this this human dominated era 
where we're changing the chemistry uh, and the composition of the Earth's surface so dramatically that we're actually making an imprint on the geological cycle and the geological record of the Earth that will stay there forever. You know, in a million years, people can come back and do sediment cores in the Earth and they can actually see how the chemistry of the entire planet changed right now at this moment in history based on how we're changing the surface of the planet for all the different things that we extract minerals and lumber and I, uh, I was reading an interesting article the other day and I was looking at in uh, in Japan they've been keeping track of the cherry blossoms uh, and it was something like the the, the earliest they've uh, they've they've gone in like 1200 1200 years yeah so it's like yeah it's uh in, yeah talk about yeah collecting collecting uh direct data for a long period of time but now we're trying to get data of what we're looking at on your map here is we want to get data of where we are we want to know what's going on on now and, and see how it's changing mm -hmm. right so we get a better yeah thing of what's going on yeah we need a baseline we need a kind of a reference point to know where we're at now so we can track rates of change over time. Right, right. Um, and, but yeah, that cherry blossom example, that's the oldest existing record of phenology, which we talked about was the life cycle, seasonal life cycles of things like trees and, and bugs. And hmm. they've been tracking it longer than anyone else, which is kind of cool. So what we're looking at here is a map of the forests covering the earth's surface. So let me turn off the tree cover loss. And I'm going to be learning this as we go. Yeah, here we go. So here, and there's tree cover gain. So here is a map. Anywhere you see green is a forest. And it may not currently have a forest on it, but we know in our lifetime that forest has existed in those locations. So there may not be forest at this moment because maybe we've cut it or maybe uh, the, the desert has moved a little bit and now that's sand dunes and not and not forest anymore. But here's the distribution of forests across the world. And um, you can go to this map yourself. It's called globalforestwatch.org. So it's all free information. Scientists from around the world have been using satellite data to give us a really accurate map of where's all the forests because forests are really, really important ecosystems, right? They, they actually provide the livelihoods for I think one and a half billion people. And that's people that directly live in or around the forests. They rely on it day to day for their food, for their water, for their shelter. So that's, you know, one fifth of the human population. Surpri surprisingly. Wow. So let's take a look at Canada and let's just turn on this, this map layer called forest change. And there's a layer that we can add on here called tree cover loss. And what this one shows us is that since the year 2000, which is actually the first time we ever had a global map of forest coverage, it was just 20 years ago. Before that, we didn't have a really good map that showed where all the forests were on the planet. And you can see anywhere that's pink shows us that we've changed forest to non-forest at some point in the last 20 years. And so you can see pretty quickly looking around the earth where most of the deforestation activity occurs. Whoa. And, you know, let's look in Northern Europe, for example, so we don't just feel bad about how we <laughs> manage our forests in Canada. Um, but basically every pixel that is pink has in the last 20 years been cut down at some point. And now we can actually, I think we can even play. Yeah, we can play that out year by year. Um, now, keep in mind, it doesn't mean that today there's no forest there. The forests that were cut 20 years ago are growing back. So there's also a layer. Um, let's go forest change. And let's add our tree cover gain. So there you go. Side by side, you know, most of the areas that have lost forest have also regrown some forest at some point. Um, so this, this map is, is relatively simple. It's just got a few things that demonstrate the rate of change of forests on the, on the earth. But it's very powerful in that you can visualize and see just how extensive. Here we go. Let's go down to the U.S. Like a good provocation. 
and we can turn off our tree cover gain again, tree cover gain. There we go. So very, very active regions where there's a lot of forestry activity and a lot of, a lot of economic activity around forest cover. But you can see there's very, there's very few areas where they haven't modified their, their forest through human activity. So you'll see protected areas. Let's go down to South America where they've got beautiful tropical forests. And you'll see just how much they've, uh, they've removed of the rainforest in the last 20 years. You can, you can kind of see a pattern, right? So if this is, the, this is the day by day, or sorry, this is the year by year, you can imagine in another 20 years, what might happen if we don't put policies in place to slow that down and make sure it's done in a responsible way. It's map tools like this that really paint a picture of, you know, just how much we can affect the earth um, by our, our, our activities. And so let's go a little closer to home. We'll get a good idea of what's going on where we live. This is a low resolution map. I think it comes in at 30 meters, but I'm sure all of you have seen what a, what a cut block looks like on a mountainside. So each one of these pixels here around Vernon and Lake Country will be a, a cut block where they've uh, cut the forest and then tree recovery. Oh, I already removed it. Let me put it back on. Tree cover gain. We can see some of those have grown back since then. Right, so this, this helps us figure out, okay, are we, are we cutting more than we're growing back? Or is, you know, what's the balance? Which way are we going? And can we make sure that we either stay constant so that, you know, if we're cutting and removing at the same rate, we're not in too much trouble. But if we start to tip the scales and we're removing more than can come back in time, we might be in trouble, right, in the long run. So measuring this stuff helps us figure out, are we doing things sustainably? And also, and so I guess that's, also looking at like uh, the type of ecosystems that, you know, the creatures that live there might, might need, right? Yeah, so let's turn on the satellite view. It'll give us a little bit more context. So let's, I thought we could change the transparency of these layers. Oh yeah, here we go. Opacity. So we can actually put on a slider and change the opacity or the transparency. So let's do that with tree cover gain. Turn that transparency off. And then tree cover, this is a good one. So let's go all the way down to the imagery. This is what the satellite imagery looks like. We wanna turn on the forest layer in green. We can kind of see a little bit more detail. Let's zoom in on a cut block. Yeah, so we can see there's the landscape patchwork of forest and non-forest and old forest and young forest. And we can kind of change the layer to show, okay, so this is where we currently have forest. This layer here, tree cover loss, shows where at some point it was cut. And we can turn those on and off so we can just make sure with the imagery that what we're seeing actually is accurate. Because these are all models. This information is built on a model that we measured from satellite data. And so there's always going to be a little bit of error in here. And being able to see the imagery helps us figure out how, how good that estimate is. Hmm. So I, I was going to ask you guys a question, like based on what we've talked about, can you, can you kind of picture in your head how you might go about measuring something like this? If you wanted to make a map of this, is it, uh, how, could you how would you how would you do it? Any ideas? How would you make a map of that? I, I like per percentage of of per percentage of uh, whatever is covered. You know, particular color cover or color. How much of the of a of an area is is it covering? I guess. Yeah, like for this example here, tree cover. So if you wanted to make a map of tree cover. This is the current result of tree cover in the year. This looks like the year 2010. You know, if you looked from satellite, it looks like this. It's not that difficult for you as a human to say, well, those look like trees right there, but that is, it's also green and it's definitely vegetation, but I don't think those are trees. Right, right. Right. 
So those are the kind of things that we try to solve as remote sensing scientists is how to separate what's trees from not trees so different land cover types. So we talked about how we do that in our in our previous talks and it's it's differences of light reflection in different wavelengths. So just to try to tie in some of the previous information. And then this, so, so that one, a little bit tricky, right? But we can train computers to do that. We can get pretty good maps of where there's trees and where there's not. Here's an example of a mistake, right? This tells us that there's trees here and we can see in the images, there's not. There may be a couple, but it's really not a forest. Yeah, there's a gully. So th yeah, there's always mistakes made when you do a model. Then the famous expression is, all models are wrong, but some are useful. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah you can really see um, how, the, how much uh, more tree covers over on, the, uh, over on the one side, right? On the north side compared to the south side. Yeah, this is Kalamalka, right? This is the Cal Park, I yep. think. Yeah. Yeah. And that's going to be um, here, it's largely going to be driven by the topography, right? Right. So we know that the landscape gets higher the further away you get from the water. You know, that if I change my map and I look at something like, uh, I don't know, these maps might not be the best, but there you go. There's a terrain map. So we can see this kind of shadowing here shows that there's a slope. So we know that we're higher elevation right here. Oh. The forest hangs out here. That's going to be driven by a couple things. First of all, light. So the amount of sunlight hitting a surface. And we know that the sun shines from the south in this part of the world. How do I get back to my satellite map? Here we go. So this is this side of the this part of the, the hill is going to get more direct sunlight. It's going to heat up faster. It's going to dry out faster. There's not going to be enough moisture uh, to support a forest. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and the, the real, yeah, it's moisture availability. Um, so the sunlight and the wind are going to control those, what are called microclimates. Hmm. Yeah. So the other question I had is what if you wanted to actually do this forest change, tree cover gain. How would you make a map that shows us where trees have grown back over time? Mm. Any ideas? What's that? Go for a lot of walks. Oh, got to go for a lot of walks. Uh, now, I guess kind of the, this, the same way, just looking at the different colors, I guess, the, the blue color. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But the key, the key here is, you know, what information do you need to be able to tell what year the land became forest where before it wasn't forest? Right. So you'd have to have some sort of threshold, I guess, that would be considered like this is now considered a forest or this isn't. You can go that way here. I, yeah, you need a time component, right? You need you need to take a snapshot every year, or maybe every month, or maybe every week if you could, and then you try to track those changes over time. and And that's a really difficult thing to do because every time you take a photo, the sun's in a different position, the satellite's in a different position. There's all these things that actually make the information look like it's changing on the ground, but it's just a function of different changing lighting parameters. So we, we, we have to standardize that. So what's what they do in this, so here's an open source library. So for anybody interested in getting into geospatial or, or geographic information systems technology, essentially mapping, Take some computer programming courses. That's going to be the biggest, the best piece of advice I can give you. If you want to get into ecology, if you want to get into biology or global change science of any kind, understand the basics of how to tell a computer how to measure these things. And, and it's, it's, I never took a single computer course in my life. I learned a lot of what I did from teaching other people things and from YouTube. 
<laughs> I am a terrible computer developer. I work with computer developers and I teach them what I want them to build for me, but I wish that I knew how to do it myself. I just, you know, I, I don't have a brain for coding and I, and I really wish that I did, but here's the bottom line is, is to be able to take a series of photographs. So in this picture here, each one of these will be a picture taken from a satellite, you know, let's say once a year, each one of these is, is once a year. Now for every single pixel inside of that, and let's zoom in again here, we can see it's kind of choppy looking, right? Like these, this is not very high resolution information. Each one of these pixels is 30 meters by 30 meters. So in this case, this is two pixels side by side. So this is 30 meters on the short side, 60 meters on the long side. And if you look at one of those pixels over time, you can see how the value changes. The value of one of the colors or what we actually do is we take one color and we just create a fraction and we'll compare one color to the next color. So red light versus blue light or red light versus green light. And the ratio between them actually gives us really strong information, really, really high confident measurements of the changing landscape. So there you go. There's an example of, of looking at the color ratio changes over time and what it tells us about the presence or absence of vegetation over time. And if we take one of those pixels and we put it on a graph and we put it on a time series, so the X axis here is years, it's time. And we can see it changing over time. And then suddenly, boom, the value that we're looking at drops. Well, now we have some information that tells us there's something that has changed significantly. Mm. It's not just noise in our data. And we can see how each one of these points gets a little bit higher, a little bit lower, a little bit higher, a little bit of noise as we go. But what we really want to see is a big change. That's the signal coming out of that noise. And that's something called signal to noise ratio. And once you have a big enough signal like this, like boom, you cut your forest, your, your red to green ratios are really low suddenly. And now we can say, there we go, 2006 was the year that it was cut. And we can measure this from space now and create these maps like this. So this is a map of the entire Earth's surface color coded by the year that the forest was removed. Wow. And so here, if we look at BC, and this is a, a, a pretty cool map once you really go in and explore it, it's, it's powered by a Google Earth engine, it's called Google Earth engine. And it's, um, it's a really interesting way to look at the landscape um, and actually see how we're changing forest cover. So for context, if I turn off my forest cover, and now I color code it by year, it paints a, a totally another, a totally new picture, you know? So let's go and look at this lens. In the year 2000, this whole area was cleared. In the year 2018, this whole area was cleared. And we can actually connect this information to the economy. So, if anybody was spending time with their parents over the spring break, maybe your parents were trying to do a home renovation project or maybe build a deck or, or, or whatever. The price of, of lumber is a little bit higher. You may have heard them using some colorful language <laughs> about how, how the cost of lumber is a little bit higher. Super expensive, yeah. It's crazy right now, right? And, and so that changes over time and that drives our behavior across the planet on when we cut very, very large areas versus when we don't. It's the demand for that stuff that's of interest. So we see these big patches up here in Northern Canada. These are actually forest fires. So these are natural forest disturbances and they take on very different shapes and patterns, right? Uh, yeah. So we can tell it was a bad forest fire year in 2018, but based on all the red. And if you guys remember in 2018 how smoky it was here, you'll remember, you know, 2018 was a was a bad year for forest uh, fires. And so, in contrast to what uh, other people in other parts of the planet are doing, if we go look at China, for example, look how big their cut blocks are. These aren't fires; these are actual industrial logging patterns. 
and uh, it gives you some contrast to like what's happening in different parts of the world and how they operate. Wow, that's it. Uh, so it could really give you an idea of forest practices codes in countries over time. Yeah, it's it's a cross border camera, right? We can yeah. see anywhere on the planet and we can hold people accountable to things that we may not agree with how they're managing natural resources. What about uh, like, uh, I guess you think of Russia and they have the, you know, the boreal forest in Russia, just absolutely if huge. If they ever get themselves together, they got so much, so many natural resources there. Yeah, they don't have a lot of road infrastructure. Yeah. So for that reason alone, yeah, there's a huge amount of the boreal forest that doesn't get touched in Russia. Wow. Um, but, but anywhere that they can, you can see, you know, it's a different pattern on the landscape. Yeah. And you can see the years that were most active. Um, but yeah, this is all enabled by the power of image time series processing. Those cut blocks in China were just absolutely huge. <laughs> they were, yeah. Wow. And then look at Europe here. Look how small um, and localized each one of their operations are. So they've done tons of research on sustainability and they know and it's what we're learning here in Canada that if you if you do more selective logging and you cut smaller patches and you do it spread out in a, in a way that protects the habitats of the animals and leaves good soil conditions so that seeds um, can be dispersed and regrow and you know maybe you don't cut the biggest tree in a stand because birds will actually go and perch on those trees and then they'll drop through their feces they'll actually drop seeds and, and new forests will grow around that big tree. So those are the kind of things that we've learned through trial and error research practices on forestry and cultures that have been doing it longer tend to have a better understanding of how to maintain biodiversity and um, habitat connectivity. Huh. Yeah, so kind of a cool use case for all the stuff that we've been talking about. You know, it, it touches on a lot of things from politics to economics to conservation biology. Um, you can really see how a map um, like this um, is useful for so many different applications. And, and, and just to have that, that spatial, like that visual of it, like in your, in, in your brain, right? It's a... Uh, yeah. I mean, you could look at you could look at numbers all day, and it might not mean anything. You know what I mean? But to to actually see it, that's right. It really it really sticks in your head when you see it, and you think, "Holy smokes!" There's actually not a lot of places left in the whole planet where there's good looking forest that we haven't uh, found a way to <laughs> get at it. <laughs> huh. Yeah. So this is, this is all stuff that has come, come together just in the last couple of years. So it's, this has been the vision for remote sensing scientists of what we've always dreamed we could do, but we've never had the, the data for a long enough period of time, you know, 10, 20, 30 years to be able to create maps like this or the computer power to do it. And so this is actually powered by very big Google servers. If I were to try to generate a map like this on my computer, first of all, it would probably break down. <laughs> but second of all, if I could get it to run, it, it might take 10 years to, to crunch all the data. So this like five years ago, we couldn't be looking, we wouldn't be able to look at these maps. Like this is all, this is the latest and greatest. Yeah, not possible. There just was no computer in the world that was powerful enough to do this. That's really cool. I'm going to have to explore on these maps here. Yeah, I'll send you guys these links. You can play with them on your own. Um, I'll also point you to this, this one. So there's a group in Oregon, Oregon State uh, University, where they've actually started to play around with um, tools similar to this, mostly around forestry. And there's a really cool one like this uh, time series animator where you can go in and pick a spot anywhere on the ground, and it'll give you a little, um, a little, GIF, like an animated image of how the landscape has changed over time. So let's just click one spot here near Silver Star. And I will click right here. 
Oh, I have to actually drop a polygon. So let me just draw a polygon. All right, now it's going to generate a little time series um, image for me. And then I can spit that out and, and put it in an email or, or share it on a website or whatever you want. But they've got a collection of different tools like this. It's called the um, it's called Land Trender Global uh, Google Earth Engine Change Mapper Time Series Maps. They're really, they're really, really neat. Um, and they're powered by some really powerful computers. Here's one that looks at drought records for every, um, is this uh, counties in the, in the US? This is some sort of political boundary in the US. I actually don't know what it is. It's not, it's not states, it's smaller than a state, but you can actually see the last 50 years time series of uh, drought, so rainfall patterns. So hmm. let's look close to home here, so, like just south southern tip of Alberta we had a massive drought in the in the early 2000s and it kind of kind of went through the mid 2000s as well we look closer to where we are just south of where we are similar pattern and then it's got you know a bit more moisture over the last few years these are very powerful indicators of um, basically ecological patterns so if you find a population like your moose population is suffering, information like this can actually be very useful in helping you understand, okay, is there some, is there some weather phenomenon that's been not just a single year, but coming year after year that's causing a shortage of their food supply or increasing the abundance of the wolves that hunt and, and hunt on them. Mm. Um, the, the, everything is connected when you look at things in a spatial context. So now that we're, we're, we're starting to do these things in what's called the fourth dimension. You guys know what the fourth dimension is? Is it time? It's time. And it's a very powerful variable in understanding spatial information and how it controls um, everything living on this planet. Huh. Yeah. And it's, it's figuring having all this information and, and seeing how to, uh, how to, combine the information to make predictions, right? Is that uh... Yeah, yeah, exactly. Huh. Well, that was cool. So there we go. Information dump again. Yeah, we'll, no, that was good. We'll leave it there. Cool, cool. Any, uh, any questions, gang? Anything to think of? No, it, uh, it, I would, it's really been a nice connection, a real good like tie to, you know, looking at, cause we've, we've visited with a whole bunch of people looking at, uh, at wildlife specifically. And like I mentioned before, mostly looking at, you know, that to, to get in the GPS uh, points, which is also, kind of, which is also remote sensing and using, and using trail cams and, and doing that type mm -hmm. of stuff. Um, and, and a lot more on the ground, but then looking at it from, you know, your experiences and, and, you know, and your grad, your, uh, your PhD research, uh, that was on the ground and there, and it's really a combination of, of both, right? You have to have the on the ground, you have to have the, the satellites yeah. and just making sure that everything's accurate, but it sounds like the satellites yeah. are getting more and more accurate at, a, at just a, a, a crazy rate and cheaper, I guess. Yeah, and so I used to study animals directly. So I have a zoology degree and I studied wildlife and I used to, I did it because I love animals, right? It, there's, there's nothing more entertaining than watching, you know, animal behavior or understanding what drives the patterns of diversity on the planet. So I, I was a zoologist by training. And when I started learning a little bit more about earth system sciences and how we measure things on a planetary scale and getting into remote sensing things, I really realized that, wow, we can measure things that are the driving forces behind wildlife, habitat, conservation, diversity, you know, getting a good map of their habitat and how it's changing over time is, is so critical in protecting um, endangered um, species or, or critical uh, species um, conservation efforts. And so that's, that's one of the reasons why I started 
getting more and more into remote sensing is it really helped the research community understand the bigger picture of how do we conserve the, the wildlife that we find so fascinating. Hmm. Uh, one, one of our students, she had to leave early here, but she, uh, she's doing a, a study on um, bats. Um, so she contacted a bat expert uh, out of Caslow, BC, and uh, she's been looking at um, the, the citric, citric fungus uh, causes the white nose, the white nose uh, syndrome that bats have been exposed mm -hmm. to. Um, but she, on the email back, she was she mentioned that like all of these little brown bats, we got all these mat, bats in BC, millions and millions of them that we have no idea where they go in winter. It's like yeah. What? How do we not like wow in this day and age how do we not know where like a whole species goes to like they don't they're not too sure if they burrow if they migrate and it's like wow uh and i just it, it, and I, uh, um and when we were talking to one of the, the biologists before they obviously they don't have necessarily access to the latest and greatest tools uh as far as you know getting funding for that sort of thing right so you, you just yeah, I don't know. It's just kind of crazy that uh, we have a whole species that we have no idea where it goes. Millions of them. That is crazy. Yeah, the, the, there's, the, there's almost no limit to the stuff that we but I think can, we know that we don't know. Yeah, no, and I could see how, you know, the this remote sensing, I mean, clearly this is, clearly this is the way to kind of keep track of, you know, large groups of, of, of populations or, or yeah. of, uh, of, a, of a species. Right. When you talk about you're looking on the land and you're doing, you know, uh, hands on stuff. Well, that's just kind of you're looking at that individual. But I guess with the remote sensing stuff, you're it's you're zooming out. Right. You're zooming out. And it's not it's now yeah. we're out. At, we're looking at the population. Now we're looking at the species and how do we protect yeah. how do we protect it on a larger scale, I guess. Yeah, we can understand animal behaviors in relation to the landscape habitat and resources. So, you know, if someone came to me and said, can you figure out where they go using, using satellites, I would say, well, can you tell me this, where, where have we seen them? Where can we confirm that we've seen them in large numbers? And do we know how far they can fly and how far, well, what's their maximum range of how far they can fly? If we know those two things, now we can just set a radius and we say, we know they've been here they could be anywhere within <laughs> however far they can fly and then we start narrowing down okay so what resources do they actually need along the way do they need water bodies do they need streams do they need forest and we can create this it's called a, a habitat matrix and we can start assigning importance to each habitat characteristic and then what you do is you get multiple layers so here's a here's a layer that says the importance of the presence of streams. Here's the importance of a presence of a specific type of tree. And we start stacking those up and then we'd start doing calculations vertically through the data layers to say, where's the highest probability of where they'll go based on the resources they need and how far they can fly. And then we create what's called a heat map of the most probable places to start to go look for them. All right, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> Then we're not looking everywhere, right? We're only going to spend time and effort where we think they're most likely to be. Yeah, no, that's, uh, yeah, that's cool. That's a nice kind of tie. Yeah. Um, on, on that note, I'm just curious, because with larger animals, they put collars on them and trackers, and you can do it on whales and wherever, and you can see where they've gone. But with a tiny thing like a bat, are there other ways of marking them? Like, is there, like in movies sometimes, they, they have like a, James Bond yeah, kind of thing, yeah. Like a, a micro dot, or you know, is there small things that can be tracked besides having to put a yeah. on something? Yeah, like it, there are small enough trackers for bats. I don't think I think the limitation there is not the size of the components; it's the battery life um, to get something that small on a on a uh, thing like a bat. The battery doesn't last that long, so you have to be able to. Uh, relocate them with telemetry after a certain amount of time but um, I've worked with bat researchers in Brazil and I've helped them catch bats and take them and what they do then is they they, they try to catch them again <laughs> right so you put you put these nets in the forest and you, you, you put them at different heights depending on what species you try to catch right some 
the different vertical layers in a, in a tropical forest are little, you know, resource spaces for feeding for bats. And so depending on what you're trying to catch, you can use a different type of net and a different height off the ground. And um, you just go out night after night and try to recatch the same one after you've tagged it and you know, measure certain things or whether they've grown, go to a new park somewhere else. Does that same bat show up? So it's, it's a hit or miss, it's very random, um, but you do it enough times and you start to be able to build a picture and a map of where they go and how they behave based on the chance that you'll catch them again. Hmm. That's cool. Any other questions, Danny? No. Well, Cassidy, uh, yeah, we, we really appreciate you joining us. Uh, you've dropped knowledge on us five times. Uh, we, I, I have I have been recording these and adding us adding them to the classroom uh, for kids cool. to be able to kind of reflect on and look at and be able to add, uh, you know. Re review and add to their uh we we have them do these things called um in situ reflections and content connections cool. so they can review these and go back and and make comments and then do that sort of thing so yeah we really appreciate you you dropping knowledge on us like this and uh yeah definitely gonna have to be in touch because i think next year i want to i want to work with that tom guy and do some remote sensing in the wetlands his school's in between our school and their school I think it'd be really cool to get like a grade three class going with our class. Cool. Start working with the working with the cameras, but I'm sure we'll chat before then. Yeah, it's my pleasure. I'm open to questions anytime. If any of you guys ever, you know, want to nerd out and, and talk about anything like this, or if you have general questions about, you know, ecology or or whatever piques your interest on the science world, send me a message. Uh, Rob, feel free to share my email. And um Hopefully, before the end of the school year, I can join you maybe even on a on a day trip. Yeah, that would be awesome to see one of the uh, see one of the drones flying would be cool. One yeah. year, some year. All right, all right. <laughs> Thanks a lot, man. Thanks, everyone. Cheers. Thanks. Have a good day. Enjoy the weather. Yeah, you too, man. <laughs>